Okay, good morning everyone. Um, let's start with prayer. It is 9.45. Yeah. It, is, it is daylight saving time in day, so time is kind of confusing today. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that we would just uh, hear your word, but hear with our hearts and our minds, and then we would obey. Lord, again, thank you um, for your word and help us to study it in a way worthy of you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Deuteronomy 13. Okay, that this means we're more than a third of the way done with Deuteronomy. So, yay. <laughs> um, so, in Deuteronomy 13, we are going to get three scenarios. They're all about some temptation that is likely to come their way. And so each section is going to ha start off with what's called a protasis. That's a if you do this or when you do this statement. Um, we're going to get a lot of ifs, but God probably could have said when you do this because <laughs> they will. Um, then we're given the appropriate response. And that, a fancy word for that is an apodysis. Um, and then we're going to get how to prevent this from happening in the first place. And the answer is always the same thing. Can you guess what the answer is? How to prevent this? Obey the Lord. Yeah. Um, and you obey him because you love him. No, so, no, I feel as though that's kind of hard. <laughs> Yeah, well, it obviously is because we have a, we have a problem with it. Okay, so we're going to start with scenario one, the first kind of temptation, verses one, two, three. One, two, three. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder. And if the sign of wonder spoken of taking place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, if you must not listen, you must not listen to the voice of that prophet or dreamer, the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm sure you've all heard about how you're supposed to tell a true prophet. What's the number one thing? So what he says comes true. Yeah, whatever he says, the prophet says comes true. Well, in this case, and we're going to run into that in a few chapters, but in this case, what the prophet is saying does come true. So you can't just rely on it comes true. There's other ways to test the prophet. So prophecy is a good thing when it comes from God. Right. Um, but this is a dream or a prophetic message that is followed by something that is false. Dreams can come from God or they can be a false prophecy. You have to measure it against the word. If it goes against God's word, it's not God's. It's not a dream God gave you. Um, who have we run into that had that had godly dreams? Joseph. Joseph. God obviously gave him those dreams. Um, as opposed to a well-known leader of a following around us, he had dreams too. But they they changed God's word, so that was not. Um, so while we're on this subject, there is a difference between a prophet and a dreamer of dreams. Um, a prophet sees visions while he's awake. And he's, he's in full control of his mental facilities and everything else. Ezekiel had visions. He, when we run into them, he had some wild visions. But he was a prophet. 
um, Joseph and Daniel had dreams and they interpreted them. But they were all revelations from God. Um, so uh, it talks about these prophets or a dreamer of dreams gives you a sign, even gives you a miracle. Um, so it's talking about something that is fulfilled, a prediction that's fulfilled. Um, so a sign is a prediction that's filled. A wonder is a miraculous deed. So you have this person giving you a sign that comes true, performs miracles, sounds really good. But then he says, we don't need to follow God. It's like, ooh, ooh, brakes, put the brakes on. <laughs> you are not a prophet of God. Um, Moses warned, is warning that um, these, pro these prophets will come along. In Deuteronomy 18 is when we're going to hear about a prophet whose prophecies don't come true. But for now, they're coming true. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.9 tells us when the lawless one comes, he will do the work of Satan and he will have all power, powerful signs, and he will have wonders. So that is not the way you tell a prophet of God. Um, pr true prophets, they're not just fortune tellers. They're not just telling the future. They are forth tellers. They're telling the word of God. Um, so the lesson here is the message that the person bringing brings, it has to be true. And that truth comes from the Bible. For us today, it would have to be someone that that is just giving us more of God's word, never changes it in any way. So we have to be really discerning when we see a spiritual leader that seems really good. We really have to um, look at what his message is and not just judge it by spiritual experiences. And we have those preachers that will get on TV and they'll slay people in the spirit. And they draw thousands and thousands and thousands of people. But are they giving the message of God? Um, verse 3, it says, don't listen to him. And this is another time where listen means more than listen. It means don't pay attention to them at all. Don't do what they're suggesting you do. Don't take action on their false words. But it also points out that God could be using those people to test us. Are you going to follow this false prophet? Are you going to stay faithful to God? That's been my thought always. Are we being tested? Yeah. Um, and if you love and obey God, you're not going to follow the false prophet. Um, Warren Wiersbe says, the test is not the person's ability to perform miracles, for even Satan can do that, but his or her fidelity to the truth of God. Any leader who tempts us away from the Lord and his word is an enemy and must be rejected. So, so watch those false prophets. Um, so we've had the... The problem, we've had the, appro well, now we're going to get into the more of the appropriate response and how to avoid it in verses 4 and 5. And Betty, that would be you. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion 
against the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Okay, notice the list of verbs in here um, that flow out of, of your love for God. Walk after, fear, keep, obey, serve, hold fast. Yours might have a little bit different words. Every one of those verbs is used in a tense that means it isn't complete. You're partially through it. Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep walking. Keep fearing. Keep obeying him. Keep doing it. Even if you're doing it, keep doing it. Yeah, you're not done yet. When it says hold fast, um, I think Betty's version said cling. That word is like glue. It means you're you're stuck on God. Don't don't let anything don't let any kind of thing take you away from God. The best way to avoid the deceiver is to walk in God's way. No matter how attractive the deception, that's how we're saved. Walk in God's way. So ancient Israel, was, their government style was called a theocracy, which meant it was ruled by God. So in a society ruled by God, anyone leading someone away from God was against the law. So, yeah, and it was a capital offense. You had to kill that person. Um, now, for centuries afterward, the Catholic Church held this, held political par power, and they did the same kind of thing. Anyone they figured was a heretic, they executed them. Well, when you think about the, um, now what's it called? The Spanish Inquisition. I was watching a really interesting mini series yesterday. I never there's a, there was a group in the 1200s called the Cathars, and they were Catholic, and they were in southern France, northern Italy. But they had been kind of left alone. They'd been taught about God and then left alone, so they kind of figured things out on their own. And they believed there were two gods: the God of the Old Testament. And the God of the New Testament. Well, the Catholic Church didn't like that at all when they figured it out. And they went in and just killed them all because they were heretics. That's the way the Catholic Church did it. Now, the difference is um, God was truly running the Israelite nation. The Catholic Church, well, <laughs> yeah, doesn't seem like they were always looking to God for everything. Um, we've had other other people, Jim Jones, when you think of Jim Jones, yeah. and him, what he did to his congregation, he led his people away. Um, he was their governmental leader, and he claimed to be a Christian and leading them. Um, I have a friend who was a member of his church, and her whole family went down, and she was supposed to go down, and he's, Jim Jones said, no, I won't need you up here. Otherwise, she would have been one of them, and she, she said he started off like a great preacher, and then went off the deep end, gradually, but, and he led people away. So we have to watch that. Um, now, if he was around in Israelite, when the Israelites were around, he would have been killed. He wouldn't have had to do it for himself. He would have been killed. We should, but today we should refuse to support heretics. Maybe not burn them at the stakes, but don't support them. So the Israelites needed to re be reminded of what God had done for them, how God had saved them. He didn't save them to let them worship false gods. He saved them to worship him. And so that's that's how you can they could avoid this whole situation. Just love God the right way and obey Him. Same for us. 
Okay, now we're in scenario two, um, verses six through 11. <clears throat> if your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend who is as your own soul, entices you secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near or far off from you, from the one earth, from the one end of the earth to the other, <coughs> you shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. You shall stone him to death with stones, because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. Okay, so anyone, including your close family, that tries to draw you away from God, for the Israelites, they were to um, reject them and turn them in, and they were to be killed. They were to be stoned. And the person that was supposed to throw the first stone is the person that turned them in, the witness against them. So if you were turning in mom because she tried to draw you away from God, you're the first one to throw the stone. Um, it was serious. Now later the rabbis, you notice it said these are your immediate family. The rabbis didn't think that was enough. So they added the son of your father, so your uncle, the son of your mother, another uncle they didn't think that covered it but it's more like if if even your brother or your mother or whatever you stone them well of course everybody else this is talking about you know even your closest relative you have to do this um this is kind of what jesus was talking about about in Matthew 10 37 he wasn't talking about stoning them necessarily but rejecting them if they try to draw you away from God when he says he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me so it's talk that's talking about if if these relatives are pulling you away from God they're not worthy of, of your love your love needs to go to God. It, it's a serious business. What do you think if we live in the Moses time today? How many would be stoned? Or... There would be a lot of people stoned. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There probably would have been times I, I probably would have been stoned early in my life. <laughs> so I'm glad. Glad we're not doing that. Um, but God cares always. He knows who really belongs to Him, whether they're good or bad. Yeah. Praise God for that, that He draws us from the bad and puts us in the good place. Yeah. In verse 6, and in verse 2, and in verse 13, um, Moses keeps using the phrase, gods you have not known. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't know who they are, they know who Baal is. They know, they know who all these gods are, but they have not acknowledged them as their gods. So, they don't know them in a personal way, like they know God. That'll change. Because they're not good at doing this. Verse 8, when it says, your eyes shall not pity him, that's a Hebrew way of saying, don't let your human emotions get in the way. When, when God tells you to do something, push your emotions out of the way. Just do it. And it can be tough. And he's there if it's something at the end times, during the tribulation, there are going to be tough decisions that are going to have to be made. And 
this is going to come back. We may, we may not be facing it now, but there are people around the world that are facing it. But do what God tells you to do, and he will give you comfort for if it's something that's really tough to do. That's one thing I always, you know, probably laugh. I always tell the kids, if someone has a gun to your head, or to my head, and says, deny God or I'll shoot your mom, I'm like, y'all better say you ain't denying God because I'm going to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you don't do that. Yeah. Above all, do not do that. Yeah. There's a lot of people that, that will say capital punishment is no deterrent for crime. But God says it is. Um, if you do it properly, of course. Um, because, of course, the, the Roman Catholic Church did it a lot of um, capital punishment. And it drove people underground and eventually brought out the Protestant Church and um, it, it seems like faith grows when the church is persecuted. Yeah. So, but if it's if it's done in a godly way, yeah, capital punishment can be a deterrent. Remember a few years ago when that kid in I think Singapore was gonna there was a big deal because I think he shoplifted something and they were gonna cane him. Yeah. And people were making like, let him get caned. He did something wrong, but. Yeah, we we have such a lenient society there. Oh, poor little boy. No, he stole something. They weren't going to execute him, just came out. So, okay, scenario three, verses 12 through 14. If you hear it said about one of the towns the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that troublemakers have arisen among you and have led the people of their town astray saying let us go worship let us go and worship other gods gods you have not known then you must inquire oh you went too far no yeah 14 okay inquire pro pro and investigate it thoroughly and if it is true and it has been proved that this detestable thing has been done among you. In the middle of the sentence, don't you love it? Um, it was good. Yeah. Um, so when it says, worth, when it, I forgot what yours called these guys. Mine says worthless. I think hers said detestable. Detestable. Other words are corrupt men, scoundrels, miscreants, lawless men, wicked men, abandoned ones. Get the idea? They're not. They're no good. And they can't come to a city and say, "Let's go follow this God. He's more fun. You know, we can party with them." Um, and if um, it could be that, well, if the city follows him, then there's to be an investigation really careful investigation it could be that just these worthless guys are, need to be punished or it could be that the city's been given over to idolatry um, so the next section is about what if it has been turned over to idolatry so picking up in verse 15 through 18 You must, you must strike down the inhabitants of that city with a sword. Completely destroy everyone in it who forms its livestock with a sword. You are to gather all the spoils in the middle of the city square and completely burn up the city and all its spoils for the Lord your God. The city must remain a mound of ruins forever. It is not to be rebuilt. Nothing set apart. For destruction is to remain in your hands so that the Lord will turn from his burning anger and grant you mercy, show you compassion, and multiply you as he swore to your fathers. And did you say uh, this will occur if you obey the Lord your God 
keeping all his commands I am giving you today, doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God. Okay, God says, if you find out that the city has been turned over to idolatry, it is an abomination to him. An abomination is a really strong word for something that is totally hated by God. But you'd like to be totally hated by God. Um, it's something impure, unclean, no holiness to it at all. So, if a city has gone over to idolatry... It is an abomination and needs to be destroyed. Um, later, Daniel um, uses the phrase abomination of desolation. That is going, that refers to the ultimate idolatry of the Antichrist at the end. The establishment of an idolatrous image in the most holy place. It's an abomination. Um, so, if the city is found to be given over to idolatry, they're to treat it like a Canaanite city and destroy it. It's almost like it becomes a sacrifice, a burnt offering to God. Except there's nothing clean about it. And a burnt offering completely burnt up. They're not allowed to take any possessions out of there. The people are to stay in there. It, it's, it would not be a pretty sight. My uh, cliff note said that it's, this is setting apart, devoting as an offering to the Lord for destruction. Yeah. No one was supposed to profit from this city, so they were to leave nothing. Um, Canaanite cities face the same um, punishment. When do you they, think about it though? We do that with toxic relationships or anything. We're like, well, I'll keep this one thing because yeah, it holds on. It has some value of when things were good, but that holds you to yeah. Um, and that destroyed town. It was not to be. Nothing was but to be built on top of it ever. Um, the word. Heap in Hebrew is tell, and you went to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Did you see tells while you were there? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's also it's an actually an Arabic word meaning com any well for any ruined site. Um, so in Israel today, you'll see mounds out on some of the plains. Um, these tells can be ancient destroyed cities or covered up, covered over with years and years of dust and dirt, but they have not been built over again. You know, we're, we're seeing in the Deuteronomy God's ways. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it to today. Yeah. Israel said we have to just completely destroy Hamas. Yep. Yes. yes. That's God's ways. Because, like you say, you leave, you leave a little bit there, uh, and they're going to come back. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah. All the protesters. Oh no! Call a little ceasefire. Have yeah. a have a pause. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. can go hide and, again. And, and, yeah. And, I mean, you know, I don't know the godliness of Netanyahu, but <laughs> but I mean, these are God's ways. The he God. said, "It's evil. Destroy it." Yeah. Don't leave anything. Yeah, and you see what's going on now with this um, protest. Many, I can't know that there's I know, so many people. They don't understand. Goodness. Yeah. Um, so this chapter asks an important question. What would it take to lead you away from God? What signs and wonders would do it? What if everyone you loved turned away from God and they were trying to get you to turn away from God would you be strong enough to withstand that we all like to think we are but it's something and I mean that goes back to the world we're in now mm -hmm. look at how many people bend and break the rules and say how many churches have 
accepted so many things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you go back again, and I hate to beat a dead horse, but LGBTQ, we're now yeah. saying it's okay. Yeah. yeah. We, we are, and we're okay with abortion if it's rape or if the woman was forced, you know, not forced, but yeah. we're, we're allowing these things to happen in our own churches. Yeah. So it, it doesn't take signs and wonders. It simply takes one person mm -hmm. to change everybody's mind. Well, mm -hmm. this woman was raped. We have to allow her to kill this child yeah. because it wasn't her choosing. I'm, I'm sorry. That's, that's not how it works. Yeah. That child did not do anything wrong. Or, well, this person loves <laughs> the same sex, but they have a great heart. We should accept them because... We need what, to be an accepting church. Like what I what I've had told me is, I can't believe a God would not uh, like would be against someone loving someone else. So you can love whoever you want. But doesn't mean you have to lie with them. Yeah. <laughs> well, they use the excuse. Well, if if they were born like that, so we have to accept them. Uh, in a sense, we're all born sinners. We're all born yeah, yeah, a certain yeah. way. That's the problem. Yeah, it, yes, you were born like that. That is why you need God. That is why. Yeah. This is why we need this. Yeah. Okay. So, so this chapter again was, you know, there are going to come temptations where people are going to try to take you away from God. The world is going to try to take us away from God. Amen. And what we need to do is cling to him like glue. I mean, right now, if you stay for, with Israel, you will be black sheep pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And you mark and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, keep loving God. Keep following his ways and obey him. And you will not be drawn away from him. And also, um, um, grace of God to be with us and to have fear of God and to keep us. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we can, I can help myself, you know. Yeah. No woman. Just grace of God and, and Holy Spirit in us. Yeah. Yeah, because we're going to mess up. Yeah. Mess up all the time. Keep coming back to God. And, yeah. Love that song by Lauren Daigle, You Say. Because it's easy to say things about ourselves and things, things about ourselves, but God loves us. Mm -hmm. So we got to remember that when, when, we're, when we slip and fall, get back up and go to God. I think the biggest test God gives us is our children. <laughs> yeah. I have to say that and actually, my parents, when my dad died, that was, I was like, okay, now I have to get right with God because I want to be with my dad. Yeah. You know, I can't live a life without my dad. I can't live in eternity without my dad. And then it was, yeah, that's, that's not what this is about. This is about God. I want to be with God, mm -hmm. you know. My dad, okay, that'll be a bonus, but that's not what I'm focused on. But I think yeah. our children are our biggest, our yeah. biggest test in life. Because you can't imagine going to heaven without your kids. But, man, I'm, I love you guys, and I'm going to do my best. But at the end of the day, if God sees fit that you're not meant to be with him, I guess that is. Well, and they have to make their own choices. We can't make them. But, yeah. but that's why God stresses so much. We need to teach our children. Yes. And, I, and I we my, haven't been teaching our children. I told my children that, you know, uh, you are all baptized. You all know what the church is about. You know, you know the Lord is your Savior because you had to know that when you were dipped in that water, you know. But but I'm going to live my life for God. And I'm, you're all adults. You can make your own choices. And I hope you're walking with the Lord, you know. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to Deuteronomy 14. Okay, uh, verse 1. Just work, verse 1. You are sons of, of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves 
or make a bald spot on your head on behalf of the dead. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Okay. Um, so he calls them son of the Lord your God. Or sons of the Lord your God. First time they've been called sons of the Lord your God. So it's like, oh, he's your father. He's finally claiming him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all their neighboring um, peoples, it was common when someone died that they cut themselves. And do and shave the front of their forehead. I, I tried to find more information on shaving the front of their forehead, but everybody had stuff about cutting themselves, but I thought, I want to know about the other stuff. Um, but it was part of a, a way to um, honor the dead. Maybe that's where bangs came from. <laughs> <laughs> bangs? Cutting the front of Now, the Egyptians did this too. And where had they come out of? Egypt. So they had learned. The Israelites knew about this custom already. It's referred to in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Micah. So obviously they don't pay a lot of attention to this. But it just seems stupid. Cut yourself. I mean, we have a problem with girls cutting themselves now. But not to honor anybody. But. This was meant to honor a dead person. So why would you do that? Some countries, they still do that. New Guinea, um, a mourner, especially a woman mourner, removes the joint of a finger. Whoa. Yeah. And sometimes more than one so, to honor a dead person. I guess you have to hope they don't have too many dead people. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. How does that honor someone? I don't know, but that's that was a practice. Um, and then God again reminds them that they are a holy people. They are His. Now they're his. now He calls them their sons. They're they're His children. He could have chosen any people group group in the world, and He chose them. And they don't always appreciate it. They're a special treasure to God. The good news is we're that special treasure to God now. The Almighty Father chose us. He chose you. And isn't that awesome to think about? That should just fill us with joy. And that should make it easier for us to obey his laws because he chose us. Now God wanted them to act like he, they were chosen. And they don't always do a good job of that. Just like we don't always do a good job of being his chosen. He wants us to act like we know we're his treasure. And we know we're special. In an area we don't always do well at. Um, okay, now we're going to get into a whole, what seems like a whole other subject, verses three through eight. You shall eat. You shall not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals which you may eat: the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the raw deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat the antelope and the mountain sheep. And you may not eat, uh, you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having a hoof split into two parts, and that chews the cud among the animals. Nevertheless, of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you shall not eat such, a, such as these, the camel, the hare, and the rock hyrax, yeah. Um, for, the, for they chew the cut but do not have cloven hooks. They are unclean for you. Also, the swine was unclean for you because it has cloven hooks yet does not chew. The, c 
cut, you shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. Okay. Um, we saw instructions on clean or unclean animals back in Leviticus 11, but we're getting some different detail here. Some of the same stuff, but some additional stuff. So it may seem like we were talking about this subject and then whoop, over here to animals. But what it is, is God has been telling them they are a holy people. Act like it. Well, you need to eat the right stuff to be a holy people to me. Yeah. So it's still part of the same subject. Yeah. But we do eat the beef. We eat the bacon. That just... We're not under the law. We're not under this. No. Yeah. This I, was... Uh, God appeared to Peter and told him, you can eat anything you want. Talk, going back to... I'm sorry, I didn't get this in time. Going back to verse 2, where he's talking about chosen people. Mm -hmm. And in First Peter 2, 9, where he's talking to us. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It just yeah. It yeah. goes back to that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, we are his chosen people now. Um, okay, so this section, yours said detestable, mine says abomination. There's that word again, abomination. It's a serious subject to God. God wanted their lives to be holy. What they ate, what they wore, what they watched on TV, what they... It hasn't changed. He wants us to be a holy people. Now what... Like the food stuff here, that has changed. But he still wants us to be holy. Be separate. Yeah. Um, so in this case, abomination, yeah, is something that's hated by God. But it's, all, it's also talking about something that gives off such a foul odor that it makes you want to run away. Have you ever run into something that smells so bad you just have to get out of there go to a pig farm yeah <laughs> um yeah so um other things that god calls abominations idolatry we've already seen that sacrifice of blemished animals uh witchcraft Pagan forms of divination, wearing clothing of the opposite sex. Yeah, that, we'll we'll really get into that in the New Testament. It's 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 not it's not that you can't wear pants, but um, paying the amount uh, that you would pay a harlot as a payment as a vow to God. So instead of paying, they had a certain fee for a harlot, so you're going to take that fee and make a vow to God. Nope, God says that's an abomination. And then there's other things that will come up. So, serious things, detestable things. So, this is where they get foods that are kosher. Um, kosher is a Yiddish word that we, we've all run into. Um, it means animals and food that conform to all the dietary laws for slaughter and preparation. So if you find kosher food, you're not going to find kosher bacon. <laughs> Ever. So. Ham, ham sandwich. Yeah. No, no kosher ham sandwiches. No ham sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. So what is kosher food? I know kosher Co salt. Anything that is on this list. It's not kosher. So like um, the pig and all that. The pig, and we're going to talk about some of these things that but are they like. They can't be prepared in the same yeah, building. They can't, yeah. they can't be. Um, so like your chicken can't be prepared in the same building as the pig. Yeah. Otherwise it's not kosher. Yeah. And milk, so milk and a. Yeah, you have yeah. to have separate pans yeah. for different things. Yeah. But. So this Some people have a kosher that. kitchen, I mean, yeah. Jewish, real strict, orthodox, or yeah. kosher yeah. kitchen and a regular Never kitchen. And, I've seen it on IGTV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard enough to be one kitchen. 
Okay, so so back in Leviticus, we got a list of animals that were clean and unclean. Here we're getting the, the rules about what makes them clean or unclean. Um, we don't get the whys of the rules. So a divided hoof, not a single hoof like a horse. If it had a divided hoof, you could look at it. That was step one. But it also had to chew its cud. Like cows. Yeah. Like a cow. So, examples. A camel, a rock hyrax, and the hare. They felt all chewed their cud. But they didn't have divided hooves. Some of them have paws. Now, it's... A rock hyrax and a hare are both kind of rabbit-type animals. They don't chew cut at all. We know that nowadays. But because of the way they chew their food, with their cute little noses going all over the place, they believed they were chewing cud. So, um, but they didn't have divided hooves, so still couldn't, couldn't eat them. Um, Pigs. Pigs have divided hooves, but they don't chew their cut. Which is interesting because pigs eat everything and anything. <laughs> well, and the, the Canaanites sacrifice pigs, and then they eat them. And goats eat everything, too. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons it seems that God says no pigs is because of the way they ate. And that they preferred to rest in mud holes. Not always. I've seen a lot of clean pigs, but um, they didn't really care about where they rested. Um, so God, sanitary. A lot of these things end up being sanitary. God doesn't explain it to them because I don't think they would understand. Um, pork, you have to cook exactly right or you get sick. Well, God says, you're not going to eat that stuff. Cause... Um, actually, natural doctors, they say that Pork is not healthy because they have no pores in, the, in their skin and they eat everything. <laughs> and, they um, eat the pig. Yeah, actually. So <laughs> pork pork is so good. Yeah. <laughs> and bacon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I eat bacon. <laughs> yeah. 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 Turkey you might bacon. not like bacon. <laughs> pork chops are so good. And, and, the, and the point is, God said no to them, but he didn't. He said we could eat whatever we want. <laughs> so, yeah, bacon's back on the menu, but we don't always eat things that are good for us. So. Yeah, well, my son can't eat pork. He has digestive problems when he eats yeah. pork. And then, um, so. but you people, they still don't eat pork. No, they don't. They follow the kosher laws. So, this. they, when, when Peter had a dream and he said eat everything, so... In their um, stores, never been pork, so yep. I don't know. Okay, another interesting thing is in verse 5, we see whatever your words are for deer and a gazelle and a roebuck. We didn't see this in the lists in Leviticus 11. Mm. Now, Leviticus 11 was 40 years earlier, not long after, I mean, not too terribly long after they'd left Egypt. Those animals are not in Egypt. No. They, so now, the, now they're running. The now they're running into these animals. So God's saying these, these are on the list. For, um, I don't know, eating or not eating. Okay, next set of animals nine and ten. Of all the creatures living in the water, you may eat any that has fins and scales. But anything that does not have fins and scales, you may not eat. For you, it is unclean. In other words, it's catfish. Yeah. But I know. Did you know, did you know catfish have no scales? Yeah. Lobster. Lo no lobster? I, I always think, who's the first person that looked at one of those and said, let's eat that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And they were happy they did. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're glad they did too. Um, so, sea creatures had to have both fins and scales. And yes, no catfish. Shrimp. No shrimp. No. They don't. They don't have scales. No octopus. No octopus. 
no oysters, no crab, <laughs> no, no, animals, no she dolphins. Did, she did, how they taste? I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. How do they taste? Like, but we're not what, seeing shrimp? we do yeah. like crab. Tastes like shrimp. shrimp. Uh, yeah. what? Have what? you ever had shrimp, Miss Olga? Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Shame on you. It wasn't in my kitchen when I was uh, growing up and in my life. And, uh, That's interesting. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, I never cook. I oh, shrimp know. is so good. Oh, I love shrimp. So uh, something to notice here, too, is the animals, the types of animals we're getting, they are in the same order that they were created. So in Genesis... First, we saw the land animals, and then we saw the sea animals. So next come the birds. <laughs> okay, verses 11 through 19, or 20, sorry. You may eat all clean birds, but these are the ones you shall not eat. The eagle, the bearded vulture, I assume the turkey bull, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl and the short-eared owl, the barn owl and the tawny owl, the clarion vulture and the cormon, corm, come on, huh? come the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopoe and the bat, and all winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. All clean winged things you may eat. Okay. So the vultures go back to they eat anything. They do. Yeah. Can you they see stuff. any yeah. rule here? Did God say you can't eat this kind of bird because of no, they got a big wingspan or he doesn't tell us why. No, just, no, no rules here. So he gives lots of examples, mm -hmm. but these these birds fall into three categories. One is predatory birds that hunt any kind of animal and they will eat the flesh and the blood of whatever they catch. And remember, God does not want them eating blood. So if you eat, if an eagle has caught something and eaten a whole animal and you eat the eagle, you're eating the blood. No blood. So no predatory animals. Then you got the scavengers that will eat anything. They're carriers of disease. Um, they regularly contact dead bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, the hoopoe. What? what I'm that? not sure what it is, but it eats all sorts of insects, including dung beetles, which are exactly what they sound like. Dung beetles. So God said, no, nope, you're not eating any of those guys. Um, talks about vultures. Um, in, they're also called ossophage. Um, so they had a habit of dropping, um, whatever they caught from a high height so that all, all the bones would break and it'd be easier to eat. That has nothing to do with why they were unclean or clean, but that's something they did. But well, that's interesting. Make it easier to get to the to the meat, um, and then um, and so these rules kind of are the same for the other animals too. You you notice scavengers; they're not allowed to eat scavengers, um, like catfish or scavengers. So you can't eat catfish. They're not allowed to eat the predators. Um, and then things that are potentially poisonous, that are potentially bad for them, like like pork or shellfish, not cooked correctly, you die. So God didn't want that. Um, for the bugs, no flying insects other than locusts and caterpillars. <laughs> oh, so we can have... You can have all the caterpillars. Have but you They're can't fine. have them once they become butterflies. No. <laughs> Just, kind of redundant. <laughs> and locusts. Apparently locusts and... I'm about to swear no. Yeah. Apparently locusts and grasshoppers, you wouldn't know. They taste like shrimp. Oh, 
Let's go go out and try a locust now. Let's let's go let's go find some let's go get some grasshoppers. Oh yeah. Oh they do not. Well I would know. I was gonna say you've been chewing on some locusts over there, Miss Daddy. So well you think of these people. I mean I watch Survivor and they're out there. Oh. It's not as bad now as it used to be on it, but eating all this. Oh, my stuff. my sister who lives in Hawaii, she says she loves watching Survivor with the Polynesians because mm. they're all sitting around going, they could eat that or that. You know, they're starving to death, but why don't you just eat that? <laughs> That's edible. <laughs> yeah, because of our finicky or ignorant ways. So eliminating a lot of these unclean foods help them in their diet. They were healthier than people around them. It, it, you know, go back to the story of Daniel and mm. his friends, and they refused to eat that fatty diet, and they do better. I know me, when I start eating a lot of fatty stuff, I don't feel good, and then when I start eating healthy, it's like, oh, much better. Uh, and I think that's where we're, I thought we were gonna end up with a lot of time to spare. So we are we are going to pick up um, in verse twenty one next week. Even though it's in the middle of the food thing, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this off.